1936, a British doctor called Alison Glover recruited 389 11-year-old children for a landmark study. Each child had a medical exam and the parents of half of the children were told that their child should have their tonsils removed, a common operation at the time. Another group of doctors examined the children whose tonsils were deemed healthy and once again the parents of half of the children were told that their child should have their tonsils removed. Now this left a select group of children whose tonsils had twice been given the all clear. A third group of doctors examined the children. You can probably guess what happened next. The parents of half of the children were told that their child should have their tonsils removed. Now it's an uncomfortable truth that the advice offered by healthcare professionals is inconsistent. In fact, it's so inconsistent that an entire field of healthcare is dedicated to addressing the inconsistency. My name is Mike Farrell, and I'm one of the experts who studies inconsistency. I'm a board certified specialist in small animal surgery, and this is a lecture I wrote with two people in mind. The first person is the veterinary professional who's trying to help their client make the best choice, even though there's no such thing as a best choice. And the second person is the pet owner who's terrified of making the wrong choice, even though there's no such thing as a wrong choice. So this is my attempt to help people make sense of a system which often seems to make no sense. Imagine we diagnose a problem with surgical and non-surgical treatment options. Broadly speaking, we can present our client with two choices, perform an operation or don't perform an operation. We'll provide detailed information about the benefits and risks of the available options, and we'll give our client time to consider their personal preferences and values, such as their lifestyle goals and risk tolerance. This is evidence-based choice, our client assumes an active role and they take sole charge of the final decision about the treatment their pet receives. The second active role for our client is where they make the final decision after seriously considering our personal opinion. Of course, the individual who will be most affected by a treatment choice has literally no voice in the decision-making process. For their sake, we, the decision makers, must trust the decision making system. So, can we trust the evidence based decision making model? In 2016, we, the British public, voted to leave the European Union. One of the most prominent messages of the Vote Leave campaign was a claim that the UK sends the EU £350 million a week with the slogan, let's fund our national health service instead. Now this persuasive claim was nothing more than hype, which the Office of National Statistics described as a clear misuse of official statistics. The Brexit referendum offers a vivid illustration of the critical flaw of evidence-based choice. On paper, it seemed like we were making an informed decision. In practice, a group of influential politicians pressured the British public to vote in the way that they wanted. The Vote Leave campaign is an example of spin. Politicians use spin to persuade the public to support their policies regardless of whether or not those policies are in the voters' best interest. To make informed political choices, we must be critical thinkers who can identify and assess the credibility of information presented by politicians. But the same can be said of drug and supplement manufacturers, clinical researchers and healthcare professionals. Here's a veterinary example of clinical framing bias. Our patient has a malignant bone tumour. In the simplest terms, treatment success is defined as rapid resolution of pain and an average lifespan of four months without chemotherapy or 12 months with chemotherapy. Now, one surgeon firmly believes that this patient shouldn't spend four of their last 12 months recovering from a limb sparing operation. The second surgeon disagrees. 
Now, these two surgeons can frame the options to persuade this dog's owner to see things from their personal perspective. Surgeon 1 argues that dogs do well on three legs, and they have high quality evidence to back this up. Surgeon 2 makes the obvious point that four legs are better than three, and they too cite literature to support their argument. Surgeon 1 highlights the proven fact that limb sparing operations have a very high complication rate. Surgeon 2 might argue that recent technical advances are improving the complication rate, and they could offer a counter argument suggesting that amputees might suffer from phantom limb pain. Now I could go on, but I don't think I need to. The take home message is clear. This form of evidence based choice doesn't prioritise a pet owner's personal values. The Brexit vote and my case example illustrate the problem with evidence based choice. Although in principle we're presenting the risks and benefits of a variety of reasonable options in an objective and unbiased manner, in reality, we're human, and as such we have our own personal biases. It's very difficult to resist putting a subconscious personal spin on the data, and this spin may persuade a pet owner to choose the option which we believe is best. When we do this, the pet owner is no longer making a true evidence-based choice. We need a system which genuinely prioritises a pet owner's personal values, and one of the best candidates is a shared decision-making consulting model. Here's the simplest definition of shared decision-making. The clinician and pet owner take joint responsibility for a treatment choice. In my view, this simplistic definition is the biggest obstacle standing between us and widespread use of genuine shared decision-making consulting models in veterinary practice. When veterinary professionals read this definition, our intuition tells us we're already doing it. But believing we're doing it doesn't mean we're actually doing it. Now, the best explanation of shared decision making comes from Atul Gawande, a best selling author and professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. When he describes shared decision making, patient values literally come first. His consultation begins with a series of questions designed to highlight the patient's goals, fears, and personal obstacles. Common questions include, what does your perfect day look like? And what do you really want to avoid? Now, our patients can't describe their perfect day, but our clients can. One client's perfect day might involve two or three gentle walks. The same client might have low risk tolerance or financial constraints. Another client's perfect day might involve long hill walks every weekend, and they might be more comfortable accepting risk to achieve this goal. Now, these unique personal values strongly influence a pet's ideal treatment option. Understanding our clients' hopes and fears before presenting the treatment options helps them make authentic values-based choices. Now that we've established our clients' hopes, fears and constraints, we're ready to discuss the options. Prompting our clients to ask four simple questions is a great way to help them engage. Question 1. What are my options? Question 2. What are the risks and benefits of each option? Question 3. How likely are those risks and benefits? And last but not least, question 4. What would happen if we did nothing? There's published research proving this system helps people understand the option which suits their unique personal circumstances, and they're more likely to be satisfied with their care. But a far more important consequence is that engaged pet owners are more likely to follow the treatment program, and this translates to better patient outcomes. A great example is agility dog owners. They typically prefer an active role in treatment decisions, and they'll almost always repay us for keeping them involved by following our instructions to the letter. Now in principle, shared decision making seems like the ideal decision making model. But how does it work in practice? In 1995, MacArthur Wheeler walked into two Pittsburgh banks 
and robbed them in broad daylight with no visible attempt at disguise. He was arrested later that night, less than an hour after videotapes of him taken from surveillance cameras were broadcast on the 11 o'clock news. When police later showed him the surveillance tapes, Mr Wheeler stared in incredulity. But I wore the juice, he mumbled. Apparently Mr Wheeler was under the impression that rubbing one's face with lemon juice rendered it invisible to videotape cameras. Now that was the opening paragraph of a famous paper by social psychologist David Dunning and just Justin Kruger entitled Unskilled and Unaware of It. This paper, which won an Ig Nobel Prize in 2000, provides equal measures of entertainment and good science. In a series of well-designed experiments, doctors Dunning and Kruger proved that on average, individuals who performed poorly grossly overestimated their performance, whilst those who performed well did the opposite. Essentially, unskilled individuals are often unaware of their own shortcomings. Could the Dunning-Kruger effect apply to us? In other words, could there be an inverse relationship between confidence and competence in healthcare professionals? The author of this paper, a board-certified psychiatrist, thinks so. She summarised her hypothesis in this graph. We start our careers not knowing what we don't know. As we gain experience, we learn enough to know we don't know enough. And when we become very experienced, we'll know enough to know that we'll never know enough. There's published evidence that overconfidence is a common trait in inexperienced surgeons. For example, in this study, surgical trainees confidently claimed that they would recognise various risk fractures 68% of the time. But in reality, they correctly identified only 33%. Overconfidence has a negative impact on outcome. This study found that 30% of surgeons had at least one type of overconfident attitude. The most common was a macho attitude, which was found in a quarter of surgeons and was linked to a 19% increase in the rate of hospital readmissions and reoperations. Ultimately, overconfidence compromises patient safety. In my opinion, the best description of the relationship between attitude and expertise comes from political scientist Professor Philip Tetlock. He describes highly confident experts as hedgehogs. Hedgehogs have a strong sense of purpose. They value simplicity and clarity, and they present the best and worst options with confidence. Hedgehogs might not be right, but you'd never guess. The second personality type is the fox. Compared with hedgehogs, they're open-minded, more comfortable with uncertainty, and they're open to the possibility that they might be wrong. When they are proven wrong, foxes are comfortable changing their approach. Which is better, a hedgehog or a fox? Some might argue that a healthcare professional's personality type is neither good nor bad. It's simply a different way of thinking. But in a medical environment that's constantly evolving, foxes have a distinct advantage. And when I say constantly evolving, I mean constantly evolving. In 1950, it took 50 years for medical knowledge to double. By 1980, this had accelerated to seven years. And by 2010, it was down to three and a half years. So students who graduated in 2020 are expected to experience four doublings in medical knowledge during their careers. Professor Tetlock proved that foxes provide more accurate forecasts, but their honesty and accuracy doesn't make foxes popular. Their complex stories full of maybes and I'm not sures don't inspire confidence. Hedgehogs are just what the average pet owner's looking for. They offer clear and simple narratives which do inspire confidence. For example, Here's how a hedgehog might describe stem cell joint injections. I have no doubt that this is what your dog needs. Stem cell joint injections are so cutting edge that they're not even licensed for humans. A fox would be far more cautious, admitting what we don't know. They'd explain that one of the reasons that stem cell joint injections aren't licensed for humans 
is that there's no evidence that they're any better than other long-term anti-inflammatory injections. A fox won't be sure which dogs will respond and which dogs won't. We can give it a try, but I can't make any promises. And by the way, these injections cost thousands of pounds, dollars or euros. If this were my choice, I'd choose the expert who says maybe, perhaps, and I don't know. I'll finish by sharing some personal observations on passive decision making, also known as paternalism. There are actually two passive roles. A semi-passive pet owner role involves us making the final choice after seriously considering our client's opinion. True paternalism involves a pet owner delegating a treatment decision to us. A familiar version of paternalism is when a pet owner asks us how we treat our own pet if they had the same problem. Here's my personal experience. About 10 years ago, after careful consideration, I changed my consulting style from evidence-based choice to shared decision-making. Although I was comfortable with my choice, I was prepared to change my approach if I learned I was wrong. And that moment arrived in 2020 when I treated a dog owned by a professor of psychology who specialised in medical decision-making. She asked me what made me so confident that my clients preferred an active role in all decisions. She told me that in human healthcare, people often preferred a semi-passive role in decision-making. So I went back to the drawing board, reviewed the literature and found that she was right and I'd been wrong. I learned that how much patients want to be involved in medical decision-making depends on many factors, including their age, gender, educational status, personality, how much they know about their condition, how comfortable they feel making decisions, and their relationship with their doctor. On average, sick or injured people prefer more involvement in low stakes decisions, such as whether to take painkillers, and less involvement in high stakes decisions, such as whether or not to undergo surgery. In this study, women recently diagnosed with breast cancer were given five cards with a written statement and cartoon depicting increasing levels of patient involvement. The women were asked to choose their preferred decision-making role. Over half preferred their surgeon to decide for them. One in three preferred a joint decision, and only one in five wanted an active role in deciding their treatment. For high stakes decisions, people want to understand their choices, but often prefer their doctor to make the final treatment decision. I call this informed paternalism, and in my experience, it's one of the commonest preferences. I compare decision making dynamics to going out for a meal. A low stakes eating decision might involve a trip to a sandwich shop. We'll look at the menu, find out what's on offer, and make a choice which suits us. We're unlikely to ask our server for help deciding which drink goes well with our sandwich. But if I'm celebrating a birthday at a gourmet restaurant, the financial stakes are higher, and the staff have greater expertise. Under these circumstances, I'll personally have no problem switching to a passive decision-making role. And how do we know if our clients are happy switching to a passive decision-making role? We ask them. So I'll finish with three conclusions. Conclusion one, personal bias is natural and avoiding it requires unnatural self-awareness. Conclusion two, the people who are most likely to say, I don't know, are the people who are most likely to know. And finally, conclusion three, medical decision preferences should be tailored to the individual. If you enjoyed this lecture, please give it a thumbs up.